Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is the Foreign Press Association here, and we're going to be talking with uh, Chip Lyons, who is the president of the Elizabeth Glazer Foundation, uh, which helps uh, fight HIV, um, mostly on the continent of Africa. And Chip has a lot of stories on how uh, he does this. Uh, good morning, Chip. Good morning. Uh, so Chip, thanks for being with us today. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. Um, and I just want to uh, start this conversation by asking you, can you just tell us a little bit about the history of how the Elizabeth Glazer Foundation just came about? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, and thank you for the invitation and your interest um, in this uh, set of issues. Um, we are named um, uh, for Elizabeth, um, whose family um, went through uh, uh, just a, an awful experience. Um, uh, she uh, became infected with the virus um, while giving birth to um, her uh, their first firstborn. Uh, Paul Michael Glazer was a notable public figure at the time, an actor, a uh, very popular uh, television program um, at the time in the 80s. Um, and uh, she, Elizabeth hemorrhaged. Um, she was transfused. Uh, this is in Los Angeles. This is in the mid 80s. And the blood supply contained the virus. So it was early days in terms of the epidemic and the kind of safeguards and standard practices um, we have now were not in place at that time. Um, their second child was born, was infected in utero, um, uh, and th the children fell sick. Um, and one thing led to another, they were tested and uh, three, all three of them, Elizabeth, um, uh, and the two children were, were infected. Paul was not. Um, that really launched, um, there was no name, there was no foundation at that point, but that launched Elizabeth um, uh, onto um, uh, a fight and onto a pathway that is best characterized as what happens if a mother is trying to save her children. And she discovered there was no research, there was no assumption or presumption or experience of children having the virus at the time. Um, it was limited uh, or known, thought to be limited to um, uh, other age cohorts um, and so on. <clears throat> and that's where the foundation she created, um, uh, Ari, the first, uh, her daughter uh, passed um, from AIDS. And Elizabeth's response to that was to rise up and uh, do everything she could to prevent other families from suffering the, the kind of uh, tragedy that they did. There was no research around pediatric HIV. There was certainly no uh, medication. There wasn't, there, were, there wasn't medication at the time uh, broadly, but they weren't even looking at um, the pediatric dimension of HIV and AIDS. Um, she did remarkable things from uh, advocating and, and pressing the White House. She was a, a keynote speaker, a, one of the keynote speakers at the Democratic National Convention um, in 91, I believe it was, in New York City. Um, and uh, ultimately, though, Elizabeth passed. Heroic efforts were made to try and save her, even giving her non-proved um, medications that were still experimental and under, under review. Um, she passed in 1994 at the age of 47. Just you know, uh, imagine that, age 47 with two uh, small children. Um, and at that point, it became the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. And since then, we have continued to focus on pediatrics and young people. We've evolved tremendously just this last fall. We marked 35 years as an operational foundation. We're, we're not an endowed foundation. Everything we do is the result of donors that believe in the mission, believe in leadership and protection for children, and we carry on. Yeah, in more ways than you might imagine, um, keeping in mind the spirit of Elizabeth. Um, thank you so much for the background story of this amazing organization. Um, so you work a lot um, with African children, African families. 
Um, I was also curious about um, how do you handle, uh, you know, conflict zones in Africa and, and still manage to do your work or displacement of communities? Well, let me take a step back and put it in context. For the first number of years of the foundation, we were really focused on the United States. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, science, um, many of the biggest heroes in the response to HIV and AIDS um, have been the scientists who, in, in, including very recently in the last couple of years, keep improving the tools that are available to prevent to test for and to treat uh, HIV and AIDS. So back then, there weren't those tools. When uh, a drug, Nevirapine, was identified, for example, that dramatically reduced the chance of what's called vertical transmission, an HIV-positive expectant mother giving birth on treatment at that time with Nevirapine, um, it reduced the, the chance, the likelihood of transferring the virus to the newborn from anywhere from 30 to 40 percent down to five and uh, even two percent. Once that got identified and approved and put into the medical and health delivery systems within the United States, the drop in the United States was 95 percent in uh, new pediatric infections. It was just a stunning uh, response. But it is also testimony to the wisdom of Elizabeth's reaction, which is kids are not on the agenda um, are around HIV and AIDS. And so when they were in this drug and a focus on mother to child transmission really got into high gear, that kind of dramatic, dramatic response. At that point, um, the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, is the job done because it, it was successful in the United States? No, the, the job is not done. The issue is about HIV in children, and it still is prevalent um, and murderous um, in other parts of the world. <clears throat> um, the areas of, of the world that you've already commented on, Africa, with the highest um, uh, burdens, um, are in sub-Saharan Africa, and they continue to be uh, 90 plus percent of the children still affected, infected, affected. Uh, by HIV and AIDS or at risk of um, are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we work um, very directly. We advise in a broad number of countries, uh, 18, 19 uh, countries. We have a real physical presence. 90% of our staff are African nationals in um, the organization. That's 97 of almost 3,000 uh, colleagues medical doctors, researchers, public health specialists, system specialists, um, clinicians, uh, et cetera. Um, the countries where we work, I'm just doing a quick mental, um, you're picturing conflicts in certain zones. That's not the majority you know, circumstance. Um, we work from South Africa to Lesotho and uh, East Watini. Mozambique, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, DRC, Kenya, Tanzania, um, uh, and so on. Um, and they are not conflict zones. Um, they are uh, stable, uh, developing, prospering, uh, very capable societies and healthcare systems. Every healthcare system, any place I've ever been, including my own state, <laughs> can get better. Um, and that's the, that's the case in the, the countries that I identified. But conflict is not, that, that's kind of a notion of certain number of countries. Conflict is not on my list of, of things that we have to manage. There are many other things uh, on that list. I, I want to say one more thing, which is um, what we have to recognize is the tremendous progress that has been made. I mean, we went from no response to HIV and AIDS, where the best thing a, a, an attending physician could do is, is hold a dying patient's hand, to having now optimized formulations, optimal um, medications, uh, going from you know ten or twelve pills a day to one pill a day, going from um, you only get a, a one month supply to a, a, a six month supply of your formulations, seeing new infections drop, seeing uh, mortality drop, 
broadly speaking, being on a path towards controlling the epidemic. Uh, and that's measured, you know, with numbers about 95% of uh, a society um, knows their status, meaning they've been tested, they have test results. 95% of the country knows their status. 95% of those are on treatment, because it's one thing to know your status. It's another thing to be a part of a clinic and have a uh, regular supply of medication. And the third 95, so we refer to it as 95, 95, 95. The third 95 um, represents 95% of people are virally suppressed, meaning they're on good solid uh, medications. They're um, adherent, meaning they take them every day. And their viral, viral load uh, drops dramatically such that they aren't infectious uh, anymore. Their own health um, is strong and they have bright prospects um, to go about and, and have the best lives they can have for themselves. So the story of HIV and AIDS today is it, sometimes it can be a little complicated because tremendous progress. And yet, remember, there's no cure and there's no vaccine. So questions of sustaining that programmatic response and driving up those numbers, getting more, helping, supporting countries to begin to approach the 95, 95, 95 marker, the definition of um, epidemic control and sustaining it. That's our set of challenges uh, today. Yes, actually, um... On Tuesday night, I went to um, the Village Vanguard in Manhattan, um, and I went to hear a pianist called Fred Hirsch, uh, who has been living with the virus for a while, and he wrote a book about it, uh, his autobiography, and it's incredibly moving. It's a very interesting story, and he's one of the leading pianists in jazz today, you know, living with that virus and living okay, you know, his concert was wonderful. So I'm just saying it, it was really um, beautiful to be able to see him on stage perform some of the most beautiful jazz standards uh, at one wow. of the most important jazz venues in the world. Yeah, I know the Vanguard and I know, um, I know Mr. Hirsch as yeah. a museum. It's a good example of Let's not get lost in the statistics, um, in the large numbers um, that we can even, and I'm happy to talk about them, but it's about individual lives. And so that's, uh, that, that's his example that you saw. When I'm in a community and I see uh, dozens of kids, and I, you know, this might sound a little quaint or sweet or something, Somewhere in there, that little girl could be the first president of that country or a doctor or a business person or a teacher or something. I mean, I, I know so many people who are, have, are living with the virus. They're in their 30s doing just remarkable work. Um, they have their own HIV negative children because vertical transmission can be, um, can be stopped. It's just brilliant. Um, I, you know, children are, each one of them are born with this tremendous potential. And to let a preventable, treatable disease take them in the numbers that it still does is, I, 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 sometimes I'm at a loss for words, it's unconscionable, of course it's unacceptable, but it's just so outrageous and short-sighted that we, the world, individual countries and communities should be investing everything they can in the care, the well-being, the prospering uh, of their children. Uh, you know, what, what, what could be a more compelling case? And that doesn't always happen. Children are not always on the political agenda, which I'm happy to talk about, but it's in a, in a way, following Elizabeth's example, that's our purpose. I mean, I wake up every day thinking about how children could be more firmly a part of the political priority that has to be reinvigorated around HIV and AIDS globally. Thank you. And before we started the, the webinar today, we were just talking about the importance of President Bush's uh, support in this uh, fight as well. And you told me that without Bush, there would no, not be any um, fight against HIV. Perhaps uh, you want to discuss that a little bit. 
Well, I, I had said I'm not sure we'd be having this conversation um, without uh, President Bush. I, I, I find it hard to talk about him without using the most sort of dr dramatic language. Um, what he did was historic. It is, a, a, and I, you know, folks might think this is hyperbolic, but it's not. The act of creating PEPFAR, the, the, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, is transform transformational. Uh, globally, but particularly where the highest burdens were in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's not my personal American outsider point of view. That is the view oft expressed by African leaders, whether they're at the community level, whether they're educators or doctors or what have you. It was transformational. You and the listeners might not recall at the peak of, well, I don't know if it was the peak, but when it was still just a flaming uh, pandemic, there were questions about whether some societies were going to survive because the most productive age cohort of those, the teachers, the doctors, the nurses, the engineers the, um, were dying in huge numbers, being left with the, you know teenagers and young children and older adults and, and grandparents. I mean, that's how severe it was until the ability uh, in, in to treat, to test better and to provide treatment really kicked in. Again, the science and the private sector, um, pharma and uh, manufacturers of testing uh, technology and so on. Those things, uh, maybe they would have happened eventually but that's the counterfactual, and there's no point in dwelling on that. They happened because President Bush launched PEPFAR. I mean, I don't know how many African countries I've been in, and in a taxi going somewhere, I'm on George W. Bush Boulevard or George W. Bush Avenue. Uh, he is regarded in heroic terms in Sub-Saharan Africa, and he launched a capability um, to respond to what was the world's most severe pandemic. It, it far, um, uh, it's far larger than COVID. I mean, we, we all know what COVID's done to us. But just for listeners uh, to recall, who may, may not remember uh, some of the, the, you know, the scope of this, there were 85 million people who were infected with the virus. There were 40 million people who died because of the virus. On the other side, there are nearly 30 million people who are on treatment. Um, uh, the number of lives saved, uh, 20 north of 20 million lives saved. Uh, uh, you know, around the world, you can draw a direct line from the progress we've made back to a State of the Union address where President Bush announced the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, just for our listeners who may not be familiar with PEPFAR, um, can you just remind us what PEPFAR exactly uh, um, stands for? Sure. Uh, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, that, that's the acronym, but more importantly than the word, um, is, uh, and it was a different approach at the time, what was characterized as an all-of-government approach. So there is an Office of the AID, Global AIDS Coordinator, there is a head of PEPFAR, Ambassador uh, Dr. John Nkengasong is the head of PEPFAR uh, today and has been uh, for 18 months um, uh, or so. When I say all of government, it means it draws on the best of USAID, the Agency for International Development. It draws on the US Centers for Disease Control. It includes the Department of Defense um, because the uniform services in different countries similarly uh, were affected by uh, uh, infections of HIV and AIDS and had their own distinctive way of responding to them, which we help them with in terms of technical assistance and so on. The Peace Corps is a part of that consortium, Health and Human Services the Department. So multiple uh, all of government that would have, uh, and the State Department of course is, is a part of that. That's what PEPFAR is a, a, you know, in the aggregate. And then there are uh, very substantial funding that let's not forget the role of Congress. Uh, presidents can propose, Congress uh, needs to authorize and appropriate, um, and they did. They took very bold 
uh, Barbara Lee and other uh, members of Congress at that time uh, deserve as much credit because the other half of the coin, literally and figuratively, is how is Congress going to respond to the State of the Union address? And they respond with courage, with generosity, uh, motivated a little bit by fear, um, just what was happening to families and communities uh, in such large numbers. Um, that's how uh, it all came together and has uh, progressed since then as a partnership between the U.S. government, ministries of health and governments um, in, in countries where PEPFAR continues to work, and then partners uh, with the technical and implementation capability like the Elizabeth Blazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Thank you. Um, earlier today, um, you know, when uh, maybe a few minutes ago, you told me that um, um, conflict zones uh, were not one of your challenges. And you said to me uh, that you have a lot of other challenges uh, or perhaps things you really need to pay attention to. Can you mention some of this? Uh, I, I absolutely can. Um, uh, let me repeat the point that I made that um, thanks to the research and the work of scientists and, and drug development uh, leaders and so on, we have optimized tools, particularly for testing and treatment, and they now include kids. One of the challenges, um, uh, constant challenges that we face is children are not considered um, an explicit political priority in terms of the response. That seems counterintuitive. Who wouldn't, who's against children? Short answer is nobody's against children, but when budgets are tight um, or in the process of determining policy priorities, older age co cohorts are louder, more powerful, more influential, have more, they're at the table or they're in the streets. Um, at so much of uh, the, the improvement in the HIV and AIDS situation is due to activists, civil society organizations and, and others demanding access to improved uh, medications or uh, what have you. And there's a, a, an incredibly rich history. I wonder how many HIV uh, protests went past the Village Vanguard where you are <laughs> down in the village, but there would have been a lot. I can um, uh, assure you of that. Um, so one of our key challenges um, is having children explicitly on the agenda. I can say more uh, about that which means there's policies for children. There is funding commensurate with those policies. Political leaders, society leaders speak out uh, for children to make sure they're included instead of left behind because very often they're left behind. That's a, a sort of meta challenge. Stigma is a huge challenge. There are communities that are discriminated against. Um, uh, there are, uh, you know, how, why did you get the virus? What did you do uh, to get the virus? Well, tell that to a you know three year old for goodness sakes. Um, so stigma um, is a big challenge in some communities. Folks think HIV. You know, this is now a a, a forty year, thirty five forty year phenomenon. There's a weariness about having to continue the battle. I understand that COVID. I don't think this is the case. We're not done with COVID. We're still seeing infections that we, in the United States and, and other places, but that's after four years. Folks are tired of the masks. They're tired of this. They're not uh, signing up for uh, another round of booster shots. They're just tired of it. That's after four years. Imagine after 40 years. So in the absence, and you know, we do have very strong treatment around COVID and we have Paxlovid you know, to help, uh, et cetera. There still is no cure nor a vaccine for HIV and AIDS. And that's a problem if political priority shifts onto other you know, uh, uh, pressing things. Because if you stop providing services, if people stop getting tested, they st you're not continuing to put more people on treatment, you create a kind of service void. Where that void exists, the uh, HIV virus will reassert itself. So you can't just hope this goes away. You've got to sustain the fight. And that's hard to do over decades. That's a substantial political policy and funding uh, challenge when there are so many competing uh, issues. Um, 
And then, uh, you know, there's issues really down uh, on the ground. Uh, if only about half of uh, uh, what we believe are HIV infected children are on treatment, where th where's the other half? What else are we, do we need to do to identify those kids, get them tested, get them uh, on treatment so that they are virally suppressed? So innovation, doing things differently, the things that got us uh, to where we are today with the tremendous progress towards epidemic control are not all some, not all the same things that are going to make um, uh, uh, help make decisive uh, kind of progress in the next several years because the international community through UN high level meeting and so on and part of the um, sustainable development goals um, around health includes HIV and AIDS and that goal signed on to all by go uh, all governments was to end HIV and AIDS as a public health crisis by 2030. Some countries, many countries are on track to do that. A number of countries are not. And it's not enough to cross a line in 2030 and say, we did it, we're clear, because lack of vigilance creates opportunity for a reassertion and reinsertion of HIV into communities and, and countries and so on. So if you had um, the power to, um, let's say like, if, if there was one person you, you could speak to right now to help the foundation, who would that person be? Someone that you think could really impact um, your 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 fight or, or help, um, who would you want to speak with and maybe try to convince that person? That's, oh. a great, that's a great question. I'm going to rephrase it a little bit because it wouldn't be a person or I'm going to, I'm going to answer it in two ways. Um, the, the reason I said rephrase it is it isn't primarily about the foundation. It's, it's about where kids are in the response. Um, but who can help the foundation? Let me take that first. Um, where anyone is particularly inspired by this mission and wants us uh, to help us and, and our partners, um, those we work with, ministries of health and communities and, and so on, support our work. I mentioned earlier, we're an operational foundation. Um, what I mean by that is we're not endowed. Um, we have to sing for our supper. Every, every piece of work we do or folks hope that we do is uh, the result of um, uh, philanthropic excuse me, private sector, U.S. government funding and investment in the pediatric HIV and AIDS uh, agenda. So uh, a particularly ambitious and excited uh, philanthropist would be someone I, I, I would want to talk to because they could, they could do a world of good. Um, more broadly, um, I, the, the single most important, and it's not just one person, there's several people, uh, I would put in a category of African presidents. President Ruto in Kenya in December um, uh, committed Kenya to ending HIV and AIDS as an epidemic by the end of 2027 in Kenya. That's exactly the kind of voice uh, and political leadership followed up by um, that being a directive to a minister of health and a minister of finance the ministries of health you know can't can't do their work on vapors right it needs to be a partnership in government where it's one of the major markers and commitments of a government uh to end and sustain the epidemic in their country president ruto did that in december and i think there will be opportunities in the next um couple of uh months for more presidents, um, hopefully to follow that lead or to characterize their response in their own country in the way that it makes most sense for them. That could be in the context of a commitment to a policy of universal health care, for example, which the World Health Organization um, uh, advocates and has a lot of uh, expertise on. Similarly, that, so it isn't just one person, but uh, categories are, are leaders of those uh, agencies and organizations that are a part of the fight uh, um, against HIV and AIDS. So, you know, the, the head of the Global Fund for AIDS, uh, TB, and malaria. There's more I know they want to do as they have expressed themselves uh, around the PDS agenda. 
the head of PEPFAR has already been very clear in the new strategy about um, a priority uh, for PDF uh, around kids. Um, other governments and donors, I, I mean, uh, EGPAF, you know, we're pretty clear. People rely on us uh, to do a certain number of things, including being a voice uh, for children and a fighter, uh, including a political advocate for children. Um, the task is a very large one. It, it, it by no means is that left to one organization. There are other, so many other partner organizations on the continent of Africa, in Europe, uh, and elsewhere. But those are the folks that have to continue to say 2030 is, what, six short years away. We have an enormous amount of work to do. We need uh, more resources. We know, need more uh, encourage more African leadership and voice uh, to come forward on it. There's work being done on that. The First Lady of Namibia, Monica Gengos, is a remarkable leader uh, and voice uh, on this issue. Um, and there are many, many others, social media influencers, religious leaders. The Vatican is supportive of advancing uh, this work. It takes that sort of grand alliance um, uh, for children uh, to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Uh, and I don't know if we have time for this um, other question I have, but I just wanted to, I was curious about when did you decide to start this fight yourself? You know, what, what happened? When to was start the, it? Yes. When was the key oh. moment when you decided this is what I'm going to do? Well, I uh, just marked my 14th year here at the foundation. And as you you can tell, I'm not 24 years old. So I've been working in this um, area of uh, child survival and well-being for 40 years. And uh, I, the single most influential person uh, for me is someone called Jim Grant. Um, he was the executive director of UNICEF from... 1981 to 1995 uh, through 1994. And I saw his uh, strategic, political, programmatic, programmatic uh, brilliance where UNICEF was a preeminent leader in the world around child survival and development issues. Um, I saw what could be done. Uh, I worked for UNICEF for over 20 years. Um, it's just stunning. I still last week saw a reference to in a, or a, a Christmas column in the New York Times by Nick Kristoff that made that makes reference to the dramatic fall in infant mortality and morbidity. Well, the seeds of that is from the 80s uh, and the 90s. In fact, he usually cites UNICEF and Jim Grant as um, that's just infectious in in a, in a positive sense of what a person, what an agency, what an organization can do. Fast forward 14 years ago, I was working at another place, a well-known uh, foundation in Seattle, uh, and I was asked to consider coming to EGPAP. And I was so impressed with their technical record that I felt uh, we could um, politically uh, and through communications and advocacy and continued program delivery and research and so on, we could try and turn EGPAF's mission, Elizabeth's mission, into the international community's mission. That's that's kind of the task, because it, because it does take everyone. We can't just uh, be EGPAF. But that's that's what we try and do. Uh, and, and, you know, we have our moments. Um, we're pretty good <laughs> at what we do. But the task is enormous. The challenges and priorities for whether they're African presidents, whether they're European philanthropists and others, and there's no shortage of issues for them to try and address, but, but we're going to, you can, you can be sure we're going to continue to put forward the notion we can end this epidemic in a sustainable way, and it can include children, not leave them behind in that eventual progress and success. Thank you, Chief. And um, do you have one anecdote you would like to share with us? Um, you know, uh, along the, the years you've been uh, with the foundation, like, can you tell me about one moment where you were particularly uh, thrilled with your work or uh, touched um, or you witnessed um, maybe a success in, in this fight? Oh, I, I, 
I'm blessed to have uh, so many of them. I'll do a positive and a, and a frustrating one. Um, a very distinguished HIV researcher was going to be on a panel. I was going to be on the panel. Um, and we were reviewing um, our slides and so on. And the organizer said, oh, uh, Professor, sorry, it's too long. You, ha you have to shorten it. His response is, well, I'll just take the piece about kids out. And I said, no, you can't. And that just illustrates what happens too often. The budget's tight, you take a piece out. The, you don't have enough time, I won't talk about the kids. You don't have these policies, well, we don't have to. That's, that's why there is the need for an EGPAF and all of our partners and others that speak to these issues, because kids get left behind. Um, on on the uh, the positive side, just seeing a, a mom who gets the test results, she's HIV uh, positive herself, she's on treatment and she gets the test results that her now uh, one day old, two, a, two day old uh, infant is HIV negative. I see, yes, yeah. thank you. I think I think what you're talking about is um, silenced uh, voices and communities. When you uh, talk about children who are not um, being considered as a political voice uh, altogether, I think you're talking about silenced uh, voices. Is that correct? I, I, well, and, and just the nature of it, um, right? I mean, the kids don't organize demonstrations. Kids don't shout. They're taught to behave. They're taught to listen to their elders. Understandably, I don't think kids, most of those same things, they didn't always listen to their elders, but they made their own good uh, decisions. They're not in the streets. They're not, um, you know, or methodically organizing political pressure um, to change budgets or to force their way on onto agenda. It's an unequal fight, you know, it, it, it's like world class, politically organized, capable, exceptional uh, mobilization um, versus the kids. And, and so um, it, 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 your 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 comment is accurate in that it, the result of that is a kind of silencing. It's not intended to silence. As I said earlier on, I've never met anyone that was against kids. I've met a lot of people and had a lot of discussions um, with people who want to do more and don't see how to how to do it. Finite resources, finite policy space, an absence of political leaders. But, I, you know, I just can't, can't say the word, word children. If you're president, your foreign minister, your minister of health, talk about children. Ask questions. Are children in our plan? Are children on our agenda? Are children in the budget? So that the, the, the kinds of things that we're capable of doing are going to get done. Children need others, including with political and budgetary and policy influence power to speak for children. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, for the time being, I'm fine um, with my questions, but if there is something you would like to mention that I didn't ask you about, feel free. Um, I thought you might've asked me about um, what's roiling, not just Washington DC, but it has, um, implications um, in other countries where PEPA, which is the reauthorization of PEPFAR. That is stalled. It should have been, it has been reauthorized um, three times each for five years each because PEPFAR was created 20 some uh, years ago. It's stalled uh, presently. That's a worry um, uh, that's been expressed to me by a number of African leaders. It's a worry for us too. EGPAF has a very strong policy and advocacy uh, role to that we do play. Um, I already had three conversations this morning <laughs> uh, about uh, reauthorization. Um, that requires getting into kind of the, the nuts and bolts of 
uh, policy and budgeting in the United States, which I, I completely understand most people don't have a, a, a strong interest in that. At the end of the day, the U.S. system is such that a program gets authorized first and then it, it gets uh, uh, funding for it appropriated. Activities can continue while the reauthorization debate uh, continues, uh, but uh, I just want to uh, note that um, the reauthorization work uh, continues, but so does PEPFAR. PEPFAR didn't stop because it wasn't reauthorized on September 30th, but it's very important um, as uh, Senator uh, Graham uh, uh, said, PEPFAR is the most pro-life program he's ever been a part of. Um, PEPFAR is life-saving. PEPFAR is community and country stabilizing. Country. PEPFAR is about equity, health equity for people. It's about giving children the opportunity to live full and, and complete lives. It needs to be reauthorized, a full and clean reauthorization uh, for the next five years. Um, at the same time, uh, with plans for transition of more and more of this work to go to um, host governments um, so that they invest more of their own resources in the response to uh, their own uh, epidemic, HIV and AIDS uh, uh, epidemic in their country. So to me, from what you are sharing with us, it does sound like there was a major shift uh, as far as um, support for uh, HIV uh, infected um, communities between the Bush presidency and subsequent presidencies? No, uh, um, in fact, I, I would say that uh, 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 President Obama and I, I would also say um, President Trump, they basically kept PEPFAR at the same level. Um, and uh, the issue around reauthorization isn't about the administration. The, I, I think it would be useful if the Biden administration were really vocal and clear that reauthorizing PEPFAR is a legislative priority for them. Um, I, I think that's very important. Where it's got hung up is uh, a very specific issue with a couple of members of Congress who unfortunately have uh, been encouraged um, to believe that the PEPFAR somehow has been changed um, and is a strong stealth or explicit proponent abortion. That's not true. I, I'm the CEO of an organization. Um, the last thing in the world I or any of our colleagues would do is to use U.S. government funding for something that it, PEPFAR is, it is not a part of the PEPFAR program. You don't play around with things like that. You, you make sure you're squeaky clean. You're following very closely uh, what the parameters are um, in terms of funding that's made available by CDC or USAID or the Department of Defense. So um, un unfortunately, a seed was planted and in the political env environment we we're in, in, in 2024, um, the question abortion divides um, a lot of people. And it, at times it almost feels like it's a fact-free zone. Um, things are stated that are not corroborated where there's no evidence of that. In fact, there's, there's no practice of it, but things are a, a, a little, uh, th that poses a substantial uh, challenge as well. Thank you so much, Chip. Um, I'm, I just wanted to give some time for potential questions from uh, our listeners. Um, and um, yeah, and I'm happy to answer these questions if there are any. Let me just check. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Um, but if anybody has one, we are ready for them. And maybe Chip, while um, I'm I'm waiting or looking at the chat box, would you like to? Um, perhaps say something to journalists all over the world uh, covering all kinds of topics, uh, including especially health topics. Would you like to maybe say something to them since we uh, are trying to be the voice of international reporters? Yeah, 
Uh, that's a good question. And I, I, I would put journalists into the same category, um, whether you're interviewing um, political leaders uh, or aspiring political leaders. Um, I, ask them if they have an agenda for children um, in, in their country or in their party or what have you. What, what are the elements of, of that? Do you see yourself as a leader that's speaking as well for children? And if they, I, I would imagine often the answer to that would be, of course, tell us about it. how did, you know, what are the policies you would advance that would lead to an improved set of circumstances for kids? How do those policies get executed? How, um, how does your budget reflect uh, a commitment to children? People don't have to have all their own ideas formulated about it. Ask the question. Ask about children. See what people have to say. And in some cases, they might just quickly say, oh, my goodness, we really haven't developed, um, uh, uh, really formulated a plan, whether it's education, whether it's nutrition, whether it's around HIV uh, or in other areas, posing the question so that uh, leaders of different kinds should anticipate they're going to be asked about that and, and develop their own ideas and be reminded that while no one's against children, they are so regularly left behind. Kind of an assumption, I had one, back to your anecdote uh, com question. I uh, was in a conversation with the head of global health in a major pharmaceutical company. And when we were talking, and I was characterizing where we are, the, the pediatric AIDS, he kind of took off his glasses he said, God, I just assumed the children would be taken care of. And I thought, how, how could you assume that? I mean, we do that as parents. We do that as members of a school or parents of a school and PTAs and so on. We find expression in, in different ways for our concern about kids. But it doesn't often or always anyway translate into major national or state, in the case of the United States, or provincial or county priority to kids. And so folks need to be uh, asked about that. There's, mm -hmm. there's room always to do more for kids. So push a little bit with respect yeah. to the question. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is a conversation that um, maybe is not being uh it is not happening a lot. And I just saw one question in the chat box, uh, but I think you may have answered it already. It's, do you have any complaints about um, reporters or um, how they actually handle uh, that topic? But I think your main complaint is the absence of the question. Yeah, I'm not in the business of complaining about uh, journalists. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should. <laughs> I, 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 that might be a dead end uh, road, but but seriously, I've been a communications officer in, during a time of war in Mozambique when I worked there um, in the the late eighties. Um, thank goodness for the BBC at that time. Thank goodness for so many other journalists, and thank goodness part of their line of thinking is what are the what are the effects on these circumstances this is in mozambique and south africa uh, or still during the apartheid what's happening to kids uh and you can go into the record and see there's some remarkable reporting as well as remarkable research that sought to answer that question i think the more journalists um the, the more journalists that say at least part of my line of interest and and inquiry um, includes the circumstances for kids wherever they are. I'm not just talking about HIV uh, and AIDS, and I'm not just talking about Africa. Just make, make that a topic that folks um, uh, uh, are given the opportunity to speak to it. Thank you, Chief. I think we are at the end of our conversation. Um, so I'm very happy you were able to make time for this webinar today, and I look forward to having more conversations in the future. And um, thank you so much for your important insights into uh, this fight and into um, the future of children. I really enjoyed talking with you, Emily, and I'd be happy to do so again when you're moved uh, to do that. So uh, thank you for creating the opportunity in your own way. You might not have thought about it, 
-hmm. this way when it first came to you, but this is a good example where you decided to ask a bunch of questions about kids and HIV. It's very helpful. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.